Starbase is buzzing with activity once again. In the past week alone, we've seen major progress, not just for Starship's Flight 9, but also in the readiness of future launch vehicles and ongoing infrastructure upgrades across the site. Let's break it all down. Kicking things off, on April 3rd, Super Heavy Booster 14 successfully completed its static fire test at the orbital launch mount. All 33 Raptor engines ignited and fired for approximately 8 seconds, validating engine performance and systems integration ahead of flight. Soon after the test, the booster was detached from the launch mount and transported back to the production site on Tuesday afternoon. It now resides inside Mega Bay 1, where it has entered the final stretch of pre-launch preparations. During this phase, the booster will undergo detailed post-static fire inspections, particularly focused on the health of its engines. Simultaneously, the booster will receive final system upgrades, including refinements to avionics, plumbing, and pressurization subsystems, as well as installation of the hot stage ring, to ensure everything is flight ready. It's also worth noting that Booster 14 is not just any prototype, it's the same vehicle that was successfully recovered during Flight 7 in January. Flight 9 will mark the first time SpaceX reuses a super heavy booster, a critical step toward rapid reusability. Even more impressive, SpaceX confirmed that 29 of the 33 Raptor engines on Booster 14 are flight-proven, reused directly from its previous mission. Beyond just the engines, several structural and subsystem components, including the chines, electrical systems, plumbing, and more, have also been carried over from Flight 7 rather than replaced. Booster 14's partner for Flight 9, Ship 35, is currently inside Mega Bay 2, preparing for static fire testing. Installation of the aft flaps, along with other critical structural and avionic systems, is progressing steadily. Meanwhile, preparations for engine installation are already underway, suggesting that SpaceX has likely identified and addressed the root cause of the propellant leak that occurred during Flight 8, which led to engine failure and ultimately resulted in the loss of the vehicle. The upcoming static fire will recreate flight-like conditions to validate the design fixes and ensure the issue is fully resolved. Only after these fixes prove effective will the FAA issue a launch license for Flight 9. While all eyes are on Flight 9, Starbase is quietly laying the groundwork for the future, with vehicle integration and testing already underway for upcoming missions, including next-gen versions of both Starship and Super Heavy. Super Heavy Booster 17, which is expected to fly on the 11th integrated test flight, was rolled out to the Messy test site early Tuesday morning to kick off its pre-launch test campaign. The booster underwent two back-to-back -back cryogenic proof tests on Tuesday and Wednesday, one focused on the methane tank and the other on the oxygen tank, to verify the integrity of the tanks and the reliability of the propellant plumbing. More cryo tests are expected over the coming days, this time likely involving both the liquid methane and liquid oxygen tanks. These tests are critical for confirming the booster's structural resilience under flight-like conditions. Based on multiple indicators, Booster 17 is believed to be the final prototype built under the Block 1 configuration. Starting with Booster 18, SpaceX is expected to transition to the upgraded Block 2 boosters. According to official graphics shared by SpaceX, the upcoming Block 2 variant of the Super Heavy will be 1.3 meters taller and deliver roughly 15% more liftoff thrust compared to the current Block 1 models. One of the key structural upgrades is a taller internal header tank, a change I've already broken down in detail in a previous video. You can find that linked in the description if you'd like a deeper explanation, but I'll skip it here to avoid repeating info for regular viewers. In the past few months, SpaceX conducted cryogenic proof tests on this taller header tank at their McGregor facility. These tests likely assessed structural performance under cryo-loading and high-pressure cycling, ensuring the tank can handle the thermal and mechanical stresses expected during flight. A header tank built to that same upgraded design has now been seen integrated into a test article at Starbase, likely Booster 18.1, which includes the booster aft section and features a revised plumbing layout. It features two main propellant lines exiting the aft end at 60-degree offsets, which appear to serve as the new dual quick disconnect interfaces for Block 2. Also, supporting evidence has surfaced at the Massey test site, where a new cryogenic loading station is being outfitted with ports matching the 60 degrees offset configuration. This redesigned ground connection setup will enable faster and more efficient propellant loading in future, significantly reducing overall tanking time. That's a big deal for rapid turnaround and high cadence operations, especially as Starship moves toward faster refueling for back-to-back -back launches. Secondly, it adds redundancy. If one QD malfunctions during tanking, the second could act as a backup, 
adding robustness to the system. If this dual QD architecture becomes standard, then Pad B, currently under construction, will almost certainly be designed with two independent fueling interfaces to match. As construction progresses, we'll likely get visual confirmation of this change on the pad structure itself. The upcoming test of this Block 2 article will validate whether the new structural and plumbing design changes perform as intended and offer measurable improvements over the current Block 1 architecture. If everything checks out, Booster 18 could become the first full-scale Block 2 Super Heavy. But SpaceX isn't stopping at Block 2. The long-term roadmap includes evolving this design into an even taller, more powerful Block 3 booster, featuring further improvements in thrust, efficiency, and potentially durability for repeated reuse. In parallel, Starship itself is progressing toward its Block 3 design, with early signs pointing to Ship 39 as the first prototype. Ship 39's nose cone and a header tank were recently spotted inside the Star Factory, giving us a sneak peek into the redesigned upper stage. All these changes, both in the booster and the ship, signal that Starship is entering a major new phase of hardware evolution. But this video only scratches the surface. If you want a deep dive into how these next-gen designs differ from current prototypes, covering everything from structure and plumbing to engines and reusability upgrades, check out the linked videos in the description. There's a whole playlist covering everything you need to know. Construction of the second orbital launch pad is progressing at a significant pace. Teams continue testing the Tower B chopstick arms, with recent tests focusing on horizontal movements along with arm opening and closing actions to help calibrate the actuators. More arm tests are expected in the coming weeks, including both horizontal and vertical movements, along with water bag trials to evaluate their load-bearing capacity before they're cleared for rocket stacking and catching operations. Near the launch tower, work on the flame trench is advancing steadily. A layer of concrete has already been poured, partially covering the trench floor. The remaining areas will be filled in the coming weeks. Two weeks ago, five support pillars were installed at the center of the trench to anchor the massive flame diverters that will redirect engine exhaust during launch. More recently, a large steel cross frame, designed to span across those five support structures, was delivered to the launch site. This frame will soon be mounted and locked into place, forming the foundation upon which the actual flame diverters will be installed. Meanwhile, work on the flame diverter itself is progressing at the Sanchez site. Teams continue drilling evenly spaced holes into the diverter's water channels, which will enable water to be sprayed through them during engine ignition. This high-pressure water will help absorb heat and dampen acoustic shock as the diverter redirects exhaust away from the pad. Work on the Pad B launch mount is also moving forward at Sanchez, with teams currently focused on integrating water delivery channels into the top deck crucial for cooling and sound suppression during booster engine ignition. Installation of water storage tanks for Pad B is in progress, and excavation work to lay the pipelines that will supply water to the launch pad is well underway. Sections of these large diameter pipes have started arriving on site, and installation is gradually progressing. Altogether, several months of work remain to complete the works and bring Pad B into full operation. Following a brief two-week downtime, demolition work on the high bay has restarted at the production site. Crews are actively cutting through the structural columns and beams, floor by floor, allowing them to safely remove the building's massive wall panels one section at a time. In addition to the high bay, demolition of the Stargate office building began on Thursday morning. The wedge-shaped section of the Star Factory will also be torn down along with the high bay and Stargate to make room for the upcoming Gigabay rocket integration facility. Once completed, Gigabay will rise 116 meters tall and offer a staggering 1.3 million cubic meters of interior space to support full-scale stacking of starships and super-heavy boosters under one roof. If you want to learn more about the Gigabay project in detail, check out my previous video linked in the description. A similar integration facility is also planned for SpaceX's Roberts Road site at Kennedy Space Center, which will support Starship missions launching from Pad 39A. Groundwork has already begun at that site as seen in recent satellite imagery. The launch tower at Pad 39A was assembled back in 2022. More recently, excavation work has kicked off at the pad to build a flame trench, very similar to the setup currently under construction for Starbase Pad B in Texas. According to SpaceX, pending environmental approvals, the first Starship launch from Florida is expected by late 2025. The Soyuz MS-27 spacecraft successfully launched from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on April 8, carrying three crew members to the International Space Station. The launch proceeded smoothly, with standard stage separations occurring as planned, eventually placing the spacecraft into a trajectory towards the ISS. 
The MS-27 mission is a collaborative effort between Roscosmos and NASA, each contributing highly skilled personnel to the mission. Commanding the spacecraft is veteran Russian cosmonaut Sergei Rajakov, who brings extensive flight experience from two previous missions aboard the ISS. He is joined by fellow Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexei Zabritsky, a flight engineer selected in 2018 and now making his first trip to space. Completing the trio is NASA astronaut Johnny Kim, also on his inaugural spaceflight. Kim is no ordinary rookie, his background spans elite military service, medicine, and aerospace. Born in Los Angeles to South Korean immigrants, Kim served as a U.S. Navy SEAL and completed over 100 combat operations during the Iraq War. After his military service, he earned a medical degree from Harvard Medical School and worked as a flight surgeon, gaining direct experience with the physiological demands of human spaceflight. He joined NASA's Astronaut Corps in 2017, quickly becoming one of its most versatile recruits. After completing a two-orbit, three-hour journey, the MS-27 spacecraft executed a series of automated rendezvous and final approach maneuvers before docking precisely with the nadir-facing port of the Pritchell module, marking a successful integration with the ISS. Once hard dock was confirmed and leak checks completed, the hatches between Soyuz and the ISS were opened, allowing the new arrivals to join the seven crew members already aboard. This temporarily raised the station's occupancy to 10. During their planned eight-month stay, the MS-27 crew will engage in a variety of scientific experiments, focusing on human health, biology, physics, and technology development, aimed at advancing space research and benefiting life on Earth. They may also conduct spacewalks for maintenance or to install new equipment, enhancing the station's capabilities. As the MS-27 crew settles into their mission, the previous Soyuz MS-26 crew is scheduled to undock from the station and return to Earth on April 19. This return, occurring about 12 days after MS-27's arrival, ensures a smooth handover, maintaining continuity in ISS operations and research. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, so you never miss an episode.